Praise God. Praise God. I want you to lift your hearts to heaven. Lift your hands, if you will, to him. And believe. Believe on the finished work of Calvary. Receive the work of the cross. Would you ask the Holy Spirit to work in your hearts this morning? And ask the Holy Spirit of God to make revelations of Calvary real to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, wonderful Jesus, for all that you have done. Lord, we pray this morning that we will receive that grace and not receive that grace in vain, but we will know the work of grace and the power of your grace because of Jesus and his coming. Hallelujah. So, Lord, I ask you, would you open your hearts, people, everyone, just open your heart to the Lord. Would you just pray from your heart, say, Lord, minister to me today. Speak to me today the words of eternal life. What must I do, Lord? What must I do with the rest of the years you have given me? You have ordained and destined for me. Before I see you face to face, wonderful Jesus, reveal, Lord, specially to me in a personal way. Would you please, Holy Spirit, take over my heart this morning and work in me. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 We have, for two weeks now, talked about entering heaven. We have talked about two weeks, the great salvation of God that must not be lost. Where Apostle Paul tells us to lay hold of the eternal life that God has given us. And we know it is only by the grace of God, for by grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Where we declare John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That whosoever believes in him we have looked at the word believe and we say the word believe is in the Greek pisto. God so loved the world that whosoever believe in him, the word believe is pisto. Yes, and the same Greek word pisto is found in Matthew chapter 25 where we saw the parable of uh, the talents where those that have been faithful to what God has given them, the spiritual gift, I mean, the spiritual grace for salvation. And it is the same pistol that is described about that servant, where Jesus says, thou good and faithful servant. Thou good and faithful pistol, the same word pistol, faithful servant, you see. And that gives us an indication, even though salvation is free, salvation is by grace. And those that believe him, those that believe on the Son shall have everlasting life. There is this part uh, where Jesus in the parable gives us a, a glimpse of what this believer is like. If you, if, if you want to use the word believe, whosoever believe in him shall not perish. This belief is described in Matthew 25 as that faithful servant holding on, laying hold of eternal life. Hallelujah. So I pray this series is a, a, 
uh, perhaps I said that again, one of the most important message that you will hear as a Christian because it affects your eternity and my eternity. This morning, I want to bring it to a conclusion. I will just you share and I will just begin to share with you a few more passages of scripture. This morning, we want to look at the lukewarm Christians. The lukewarm Christians where Jesus was the one who came and revealed in the book of Revelation. Uh, the lukewarm Christians will be another group of Christians that will miss heaven. If you can accept the passage of scripture, it's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, reading from verse 14 to 22. Jesus himself said this. He said uh, to the church of Laodicea. Okay, just to give you a background of Laodicea, this is one of the seven churches in Asia Minor. And... Laodicea, how the church of, uh, how the city of Laodicea, according to historians, got their name, is from Achitus. Achitus the second, the king of Syria, has a wife called Laodis, and this king of Syria named the city of Laodicea after his wife Laodis. So Laodicea is a city according to historians, that it is a city that is quite prosperous. It is a prosperous city. It's a city of trade and commerce and timber. And this city also is a city of bankers. So it has got bankers, it has got traders and merchants. And um, apparently there was an earthquake sometime uh, in Laodicea, where this, the people in Laodicea were quite affluent. And because they were affluent, they became independent. They did not request for aid from the Roman, uh, from the Roman Empire. They rebuilt the city after the earthquake. Okay, so this is a little bit of historical background of the city. And you can understand why. Uh, the Laodiceans, therefore, in the revelation by Jesus, uh, consider themselves to be rich and they have nothing because it is quite a rich city of trade and commerce and banking. Okay, so let us read and let us glean from here the revelations from God, uh, what we can learn and apply to our lives. Uh, perhaps this is a very, very important message that you will hear. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 22. I hope you are there right now in your Bible. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write. Why to the angel? Because the angel is the messenger of God. The messenger. The messenger brings forth the message from God. So some believe this messenger is the local pastor or the local leader of the church. Uh, some some uh, commentaries have commented that this angel uh, is the local pastor that, is, that brings the message. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things said the Amen. See, Jesus, when he was on earth, he constantly say, Truly, truly, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I, I say to you. The word truly, truly means amen. So be it. It is the truth. And so he is the amen personified. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So he declared him, his title, who he was. He is the amen that is speaking. There is no lie in him. He is the one who constantly says, truly, truly, I say to you. You find that in the Gospels. And uh, he is the faithful and true witness. And he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the creation of God. So this is the one that is bringing the message to the church of Laodicea. And he opens with this uh, very amazing statement 
a, a statement that is, I pray the Holy Spirit will make it real to us. It's a very searching statement where he declares, I know your works. There is nothing that can escape the eyes of Jesus in your life and in my life and in the life of the church. He begins with the statement, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot, but you were neither cold nor hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, you are neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and I'm increased with goods, and have need of nothing. But knowest thou that they that, that knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus revealed five things about the Lodician church. He says, You did not know that you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor. Number four, you are blind. And number five, you are naked. But they thought that they were rich and they had need of nothing. Yes, and they have increased with goods. So then Jesus went and counseled them and says, I counsel you to buy from me three things. He counseled them. One is gold tried in the fire that thou may be rich. Number two, he counseled them to buy white raiment that they may be clothed so that they won't be naked. And number three, he says, anoint your eyes with eyes off that thou may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. This is a message of love. And I want to bring you a message of love, even though it's a serious message. It is because God loves us. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. We often use this verse in salvation message to sinners. Uh, we put it in the salvation tracks, uh, in the sinner's prayer. We tell the sinner, Jesus stands at the door of your heart and knock. If you open the door of your heart, he will come in and fellowship with you. But actually, this verse is written to the church, the church of Laodicea. And... Uh, then he concludes with the last verse in verse 22. To him that overcome, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So this morning, I want to uh, bring you to an exposition of this passage of scripture and let the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Okay, you just pray to God and ask God to speak to you. What is God? What does God want to speak to your heart? We see here a very uh, strong and dramatic reaction of Jesus to lukewarmness. He says, uh, because you are neither cold nor hot, uh, I wish that you are either cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out from my mouth. That speaks to us about Christ completely rejecting lukewarmness in Christians. You may not like to hear it, but this is what Jesus revealed. And John saw in the vision on the island of Patmos, Jesus have a strong reaction to lukewarmness in Christians. He finds them distasteful and he is disgusted with them. And the description used is so strong and shocking that he spewed them out 
of his mouth. It's a very shocking and very strong, dramatic reaction of Christ to lukewarmness of the church. And uh, it's an uh, illustration like, let me give, uh, just expound this a little bit. It's like uh, you have bad food in your mouth without knowing the food was bad. And the moment you take a spoon of that bad food that comes into your mouth, your automatic reaction is to spit it out because you cannot take it in your system and you don't want to have any part with it. And so your automatic reaction is to reject it completely and you spit it out of your mouth. Such was the picture of Christ's reaction to a lukewarm church. That's why I say these three weeks are serious parables that we are looking at. And uh, I wish we only have John 3.16 in the Bible. If we only have John 3.16, how wonderful we say, oh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And all I have to do is just to believe. And then I will enter into everlasting life. But God gave us parables after parables and uh, description like today, this morning, in the book of Revelation chapter 3, that Christ totally reject lukewarmness of the church. These are not my words. These are uh, the conclusion we can draw from this passage of scripture. He says, I will spew you out from my mouth. That's number one. I would like you to take note. Number two is Jesus knows everything. We got to know, we got to be aware and conscious that Jesus knows everything in the church and Jesus knows everything in our life. He says, I know your works. See, so nothing can, nothing can escape his eyes. Now let's go a bit further in our exposition and ask, why did Jesus reject the lukewarm church? The Bible says, uh, because thou sayest, because the church of Laodicea say to themselves, I am rich, you see. Number one, they say that they are rich. In other words, they are proud of their wealth or of its wealth. The city of Laodicea, I share with you in the introduction, was a prosperous city. It was a city with bankers. It was a city of commerce and trade. And so the church is also wealthy. And the church says, I am rich. In other words, there is pride. There is proud in their wealth. And number two, they say, I am increased with goods. If you read between the lines, they are saying, look, uh, they are proud of their wealth. They have security on their wealth. They place the security on their possession on what they have, a church. Perhaps they have big buildings, perhaps they have facilities and et cetera. And they are self-satisfied. That was their spirit. It says, I have need of nothing. How can anyone truly have a true revelation of self and have a true revelation of God can make this statement? I have need of nothing in a negative sense, all right? I have need of nothing, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and therefore what's wrong with the Laodicean church and that Jesus totally reject? He says, uh, uh, though you have all these things, he says, I reject you, I will spew you out from my mouth because they have a wrong perception of true riches. They have truly a wrong reception of true riches. And they have a wrong perception of their need and a wrong sense of security. That was the condition of the Laodicean church. But you say, Pastor, why are we studying about the Laodicean church? And the Laodicean church is a type of a church. You see, there are seven churches in the book of Revelation. It is a type of a church of the end time. Bible scholars all unanimously agree that it is a type of the end time church, the era that we are living in. So this end time church, 
their problem or the problem with the end time church is that they have a wrong perception of themselves and their need and they have a wrong sense of security and they say we have need of nothing this is the only church among the seven churches if you study very carefully revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is the only church that jesus cannot find any positive affirmations all the other churches you see jesus found some good points and jesus says uh, i know your works you have been patient you labor uh, you test the false prophet uh, false apostles and found they were not apostles but this was the only church where jesus if you read carefully cannot find to give any positive affirmation that's the Laodicean church all right and uh jesus in fact reveal their condition jesus says five things about them their spiritual state don't you know you are not aware number one you are wretched number two you are miserable number three you are poor number four you are blind and Number five, you are naked. That's a big description, massive description of their true spiritual condition, which they did not realize. And they thought they were strong. They thought they were good. They thought they are wealthy and they have need of nothing. All right, that's the introduction. And we find Jesus totally reject this lukewarm church. You can extend this lukewarm church to be a lukewarm Christians because the church is made up of individual Christians. So Jesus totally reject lukewarmness in a Christian. If you can, if you allow me to conclude by reading this passage of scripture. Now, I've always wondered why Jesus says, I wish you were either hot or cold. I say, Lord, at least lukewarm is better than cold. It's good to be hot for the Lord. To be hot, to have ferv to have uh, a fervency, uh, to have passion. It's hot for Jesus. And Jesus, I said, this Laodicean church, they are Christians. They are lukewarm. But isn't lukewarm better than cold? But Jesus says, I wish that you are either hot or cold. And it always puzzles me why. And I believe the reason Jesus wished that they were either hot or cold, because if a person is cold, what it means is that a person is lifeless and the person has not yet received the warmth of the gospel. The person has not been born again. It is cold. It does not know the truth. It does not have the light but because the person does not have the light yet and it is cold and is spiritually dead it has a chance to be hot because when the gospel comes into contact with that person the persons have a chance to be hot they have they will receive the truth like apostle paul saul of tarsus when he received the gospel he became hot for jesus it became hot for the kingdom of God. But for those who are lukewarm, they have come into contact with the gospel. But something has gone wrong. Something amiss has gone wrong. When the gospel come into contact with them, and instead of becoming hot, they have become lukewarm. This lukewarmness is something that Jesus cannot accept so in the next part of my message i want to share with you uh, time will allow me some characteristics of this lukewarmness or the causes of this lukewarmness the state of nature of lukewarmness of a church and a christian and i hope that can be an eye opener for all of us here this morning so if you have your regular pen and notebook uh, i want you to just grab your pen and notebook and just jot down these points and meditate on them to see whether that's true as you observe 
the people in the body of Christ, not just in our church, but the body of Christ as a whole. And you see whether that is also true in some aspects in your life and my life. Why lukewarmness is worse than being cold. If you are cold, it shows that you have not received the truth. You have not received the gospel. So when you receive and come into contact with the gospel, fire can come on you. Like the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they become hot for Jesus. But lukewarmness belongs to a group of people where something has gone wrong in their lives. So we want to look at what is it? What are the characteristics or causes of lukewarmness that Jesus will reject totally? Yes, Jesus will reject. This is serious because Jesus says, look at the strong language he used. I will spit you out from my mouth. That's a very serious, a very strong language. So I believe, number one, why people become lukewarm and something have gone wrong is because they receive a little warmth of the gospel. Unfortunately, this gospel was not hot enough for them. They received some warmth. Uh, they were warmed a little bit by the gospel, but they are lulled into a false sense of security that they are safe, that they are on their way to heaven, but they are not. Lukewarm Christians are Christians who are warmed a little bit by the gospel, but they are lulled into a false sense of security, you know, you can have security, but it can be a false sense of security. So lukewarm Christians are people that are warmed a little bit by the gospel. They hear a little bit of the gospel, you see, but it's not enough. It has not reached and touched their lives enough. They are warmed by a little bit. Then they are lulled into a sense of false security that they are safe because they think they have believed John 3.16, for God so loved the world that they believe in him. They will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. They are lulled into a false sense of security that they are safe, but in actual fact, they are not. Number two, the warmth of the gospel of truth. See, the gospel is like fire. It has a warmth in it. Yes. The word of God says uh, in Jeremiah, there is fire on his mouth when he preached the word of God. The word of God is fire. The warmth of the gospel was not able to convert their souls. Lukewarm Christians are those people that hear a little bit of the gospel, but the gospel of truth was not able to convert their souls uh, their, their souls are not converted and are truly saved. Why? Because they have things in their lives where they have put their love in things like riches, in things of the world, their jobs, their families as the most precious priority. They hear a bit of the gospel, but the gospel's warmth is not able to convert their souls. They are not truly converted. They are lulled into a false sense of security that they are converted. Number three, the lukewarm Christians are a group of people who are deceived into thinking they have religion. See, many people have religion. They come into the church. They have Christianity. They are deceived into thinking they have come into religion but they never experience its changing and life transforming power. Do we have people like that? You see them in the body of Christ. They are, are deceived with thinking they have come into religion. They've come into Christianity. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. So what do they have? 
they have religion, they have ritual. Every Sunday, they would come into a certain church, especially you see some of these churches, they will come into a church, they will perform certain ritual. They will recite certain prayers. They will follow certain tradition and practices. They will even wear certain garments and they follow the precepts of men, but not the word of God. There is a group of people like this. They think they are saved. They think they have religion. But these people have never experienced the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes? That's number three and number four I've given you. Number five. They have a little knowledge. They have a little knowledge, but that knowledge, unfortunately, is not able to save them and convert their souls. There is a lack of truth of what is really salvation. There is a lack of truth of the nature of their sins and the lack of understanding of what true repentance is. And so they have a little knowledge and because of that little knowledge, they form prejudice in their mind. And you know, sometimes a little knowledge is very dangerous. I always tell people when you have a little knowledge, it's very dangerous. Just like in the medical field, there's some people who have a little knowledge of medicine. They try to be their own doctors and they try to self-medicate. It is very dangerous. And therefore, there are people who have a little knowledge about salvation, a very uh, 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 little knowledge about the true nature of sins and what even repentance is. Uh, and so because of this little knowledge that they have, they have uh, become prejudiced and they're set in a certain way in their thinking. And they will not receive illumination and correction of the true word of God. They think that they are okay. They think that they are safe. They think that the Sunday rituals they are performing. They think that the Sunday prayers they pray at the festivals they follow and the customs and traditions of men. You see them in traditional churches where there is no life of God. The life of God is missing and it is a form. The Bible talks about it. They, they, uh, they have a form of godliness on the outside, but it deny, they deny its true power. They believe more in the traditions of man. And these are some of the causes and these are some of the uh, 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 characteristics of groups of people uh, that are like these, that they will have lukewarmness, the lukewarmness in their lives. Number five, could it be there are people who have heard the truth? Why Jesus is so disgusted with lukewarmness is there are people who have heard the truth, but they take the truth lightly. It's worse than people who have not heard the truth. It's worse than people who are cold because people who are cold will one day be given a chance to hear the truth. And they perhaps, who knows, they will repent and turn to God with all their heart. But people who have heard the truth, but they take the truth lightly. They are lukewarm. Lukewarm people are people who have heard the truth a little bit. They believe the truth a little bit, but they take it lightly for whatever reason. Perhaps they have more immediate priorities. Many, many people, they think they have more immediate priorities in life than following the truth of the gospel. The fact of the matter is, what can be more immediate priorities than following the truth of the gospel? But many have misplaced priorities. And so they hear the truth, 
but the truth does not sink in. The truth does not motivate them and propel them in their life. Number six, they perhaps could be a group of people who have heard the truth, but they are not fully convinced by it. Do you see people like this in the body of Christ? Yes, you can see many of them. Perhaps even in our own lives, we hear the truth. And for some reason, we are not fully convinced by the truth because we do not take enough time to seek and follow the truth. And so because you are only partially or vaguely convinced by the truth, you and I become lukewarm. These are reasons and characteristics of lukewarmness. Number seven, when one falls into self-deception, a group of people, people can fall into self-deception and we are unconscious of our own hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is defined as trying to be someone we are not. In essence, we are not. But we try to project an image that we are. And, and without knowing, uh, a person in self-deception would not be conscious of his own hypocrisy. We try to project that we believe the words of Jesus, that we are Christians, that we you know we believe the whole Bible. And uh, we are in self-deception, but we are not conscious that we are in self-deception. And therefore, uh, we are not conscious of our own hypocrisy. I told you this message, these three messages will be a hard message that you pray for pastor. I will just speak the truth and, and you just take these points and meditate and apply because it's, uh, it's something that Jesus will totally reject if we fall into the group of lukewarmness. But he gave us the cure. I'll share with you as we go on. Number eight, and because the person or the group of people who are in self-deception, they are not willing or unable to come out of this self-deception because they thought they have religion. They thought that they are okay. They thought they are believing some things that are right. They are not like the group of the coal. The coal have no knowledge of the truth, but the lukewarm have some knowledge of the truth. But the truth is not complete. The truth is uh, not strong enough to convert their soul. And they've fallen into the deception that they think they have believed the truth and are following the truth. But their life is lifeless. There is no life of God in them. There is no true love of God. In their lives, there's lack of the love of God and the love of his word and the love of his kingdom in their lives. Uh, they have only their self-religion. They live a life without the life of the spirit. That's number eight. Number nine, lukewarm faith. Someone who has a lukewarm faith does not affect the way you live. Someone who is lukewarm towards God and towards the kingdom. His life remained the same life before he came into knowledge of the gospel. Nothing much has changed substantially, fundamentally. He lives his life, his lifestyle, his habits, the way he spends his money, the way he spends his time, the way he spends his interests and his pursuit remain essentially the same except he has some now knowledge of this gospel. But this gospel, unfortunately, is not uh, strong enough in his life to warm him up. He's warm a little, but his life does not change. That's lukewarmness. Number 10, lukewarmness, somebody says, is primarily not just actions. We say, oh, someone is lukewarm because he has no heart for the kingdom. Oh, we say someone has no, is lukewarm because he doesn't pray. Oh, someone is lukewarm because he doesn't believe or work his 
gave his life for missions. Oh, we say someone is lukewarm because he, he has no heart to worship God. And we, we think lukewarmness is a series of actions. But primarily, lukewarmness is a heart issue. This may not apply to some of us here, may not apply to you, but I'm just generally teaching that lukewarmness is a heart issue. Yes? A lukewarm Christian do not try to avoid sin. He does not try to avoid sins, but uh, he just wants to escape the consequences of sin. That's number 10. He likes, he still loves to sin. In his heart, if he can get away with it, he will want to sin. But he knows that if he sin, he heard the preaching of the gospel or the, from the pulpit. If you sin, there are consequences. So he just wants to escape the consequence of sins, of his sins. But deep in his heart, something has not happened. He still loves to sin. And lukewarm Christians live their lives, number 11, with self-sufficiency. Everything remains the same. The self live their lives the same. And it's not God-dependent. Yes? Let me just give you the next one, number 12. A lukewarm Christian, when he hears the word of God, he does not hear and he seldom hear to learn to apply and to obey. He just hears it. But there's no desire in his heart to want to learn to apply to his own life and to obey. So I've given you just a kind of a glimpse of the state of condition of a heart of a lukewarm church and the lukewarm Christians. And they think that on the outside, the lives remain the same and there is the lukewarmness. It is primarily a heart issue in the heart. And so then Jesus, let's see what Jesus uh, wanted from the Laodicean church at Jesus' counsel to the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, verse 17 to 19. And he says, I counsel you. In other words, I advise you. I counsel you. See, God is such a good God. He says, I counsel you, number one, you have to buy of me three things. Go try in the fire that you may be rich. So Jesus counseled the church, buy from me gold. Gold that is purified through the fire. That is what Jesus is after in the church is true faith. Remember, we say that our faith must be tried by fire. He's not interested in how much assets or how much property or how big the church facility but he's interested in the godliness and the true genuineness of the faith of the believers in the church. So he says, buy from me the gold that has been tried by fire. In other words, he is after our faith, our faith that is genuine and that is tried. Number two, he says, buy from me white raiment that you may be clothed and you will not be naked. He's after the members of the church of Laodicea, that they may have the righteousness of Christ. Yes, by faith, we receive the righteousness of Christ. That's the white garment. But do you know there are two aspects of righteousness? The first aspect is, yes, righteousness is free. Righteousness is a gift from God. By believing in Christ and accepting the work of Calvary, it is the righteousness of Christ. But do you know it must be translated into right living, living right, living our life right. If we say we believe John 3.16, we receive Jesus Christ, he imputes into us his righteousness, not our righteousness. That is only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin 
you know, in a coin, there is a head and a tail. One side is the righteousness of Christ. It is free. It is by grace, by faith in him and Calvary. Today, Brother Roger shared the communion. He says, what Christ has done in him, we have redemption through his blood. We receive his righteousness. But let us not forget the other side of the coin, there is a tail. That means now that I have received the righteousness of Christ, I must live right. I must have right living in my life. My life must be evidenced by right living. It cannot go on as business as usual. Oh, it's so easy to say, John 3, 16, I believe. And then my life remains the same as sinful, as addictive behavior, as bad behavior as before, with uncontrollable temper, with the same selfishness, with the same uh, uh, works of the flesh. So righteousness have two aspects. He says that you may wear white raiment. That is, you have the righteousness of Christ and right living. The book of Revelation says uh, the white garments. What are the white garments? The white garments are the righteousness of the saints. It didn't say the righteousness of Christ. The white garments are the righteousness of the saints. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation. That's number two. Number three, he says, you buy from me oil salve. Oil salve is a kind of ornament to anoint your eyes. In other words, Jesus is saying, look here, you people, uh, the church lacks spiritual eyesight. They lack spiritual understanding. They are blind. Jesus says, don't you know you are miserable, you are naked, you are poor, and you are blind. So buy from me oil I saw that you may see. This speaks about the spirit of God, spiritual discernment and understanding, the Holy Spirit and its anointing. Hallelujah. Now, three things we are asked to what? To buy from Jesus. Right? Look at Revelation 3 verse 17. I counsel you to buy. Underline the word buy. I thought everything from Jesus is free. Now, why do the church have to buy from Jesus? The gold, the white raiment, and the oil stuff. Buy from who? Buy from Jesus. But you have to buy. It means it will cost you something. There is a price. There is a price for white garment. There is a price for the anointing. Hallelujah. There is a price that your faith may be proven genuine. You go through trials, you go through affliction, you go through sorrow, but you will still praise the Lord. You will still be faithful. You will never miss a single church service. All right, so to speak. So you prove your faith. Jesus says, come to me and buy from me the gold, the white raiment and the oil salve. In other words, it is not you think that, oh, it's just free. Everything is free. There is a price for spiritual growth. There is a price for spiritual power. There is a price that we pay for the Holy Spirit and his wisdom and his anointing. And there is a price that you have to live your life and I live my life right. You have to make adjustments. Sometimes it's painful. You have to give up something to follow Jesus. Glory to God. It's not that, oh, everything is given by God. Oh, he gives you his righteousness. He gives you his salvation. And then you just stay where you are and remain as sinful as you are. No, 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 no. God does his part. He gives us his righteousness. We have to live right. Hallelujah. God give us faith and grace to go through our struggle, but we have to be willing to say, Lord, your grace is sufficient for me. I will still trust you and I will still praise you in the days of adversity. I will still pray that I will not faint, you see. So he's looking for what? Gold. That is faith. That is genuine. That has gone through trials and testing. He's looking for right living. He's looking for that you may pay the price for the Holy Spirit and the anointing in your life. So that's the counsel of Jesus that he says you've got to buy from me. So, 
So he's looking for a genuine church. He, he's not impressed with the external. You see, the Laodicean church, their, their values and their perception of value is wrong. They thought that they were rich. They thought that they were big. They thought that they had wealth. And they have need of nothing. Oh, how far has, have they gone from the truth? How can any true believer at any true church says, I have need of nothing? But that's what the Laodicean church had. They have totally missed the point of what is true riches, that is faith. Yes, they have truly missed the point that they, do, they are not even aware that they were spiritually naked because the clothing are the righteousness of the saints. And they were blind because they cannot see. And today we see the lukewarm church more evidently in the end time. And we see lukewarm Christians in the end time. I've given you characteristics of the lukewarm believer. A lukewarm believer is someone who has heard the truth, but not fully convinced about it. He's someone who has uh, heard the truth, but is half-hearted about it. He has heard the truth, but he takes it lightly. He, he thinks he has some religion, and that religion is enough to save him. He has a little knowledge, that little knowledge instead of blessing him and helping him has become a bondage and set him in a mindset of prejudice that he refused to be corrected and to receive illumination. So he has a form of godliness, but he has never experienced the true power of the living Christ. The warmth of the gospel is not enough to convert his soul. There are many in churches today that are not truly converted. Their sins are not blotted out. They have religion. And so that's why their, their lives become lukewarm and, 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 and they lack these three things. They lack the genuine faith. They lack the white garments. And they lack the oil self. And today, the lukewarm church, in our end time, as we see in our age, in it's a church that preach a polluted gospel. It does not emphasize and does not extol the virtue of suffering for the cross. It does not extol the virtue of suffering and self-sacrifice for the gospel. But it is a gospel that is a polluted, that preach materialism mixed with some spirituality. It is a gospel that not, does not extol the centrality of Christ, but it preaches a compromised gospel. It preaches the love of the self and the preservation of self, the centrality of self, instead of the centrality of Jesus Christ. And therefore, you can see that just on, just on some of these messages, of these so-called contemporary churches. You can sit through one hour of preaching, but sometimes you only hear one verse in the Bible. They pick up only just one verse in the Bible and the whole one hour is preached on his opinion and his ideas and, and his thoughts. You see, some don't even quote a single verse of scripture. It is just his moral philosophy of self-preservation, materialism of success, mix a little bit with spirituality. And in the last days, the Bible warns us that this will come. I want you to turn to Matthew 24, verse 12. Matthew 24, verse 12 gives us a a clue that Jesus revealed to us why lukewarmness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. See, the love of many will grow cold, it means you become lukewarmness. 
And because of lawlessness, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. What is this lawlessness? We have looked at it in the previous week. It is the lack of the law. That's why preachers today, they don't preach the word. They don't give the word. They give a verse here and a verse there in the whole message, only one verse. And uh, some don't even quote the Bible. And lawlessness speaks about not only the lack of the law, the law of God, but the transgression of the law, breaking the law is lawlessness. When people break the law, when they don't have knowledge of the law, obviously they will break the law. When the word of God is not the central part of the message, it's man's philosophy and opinion of success and having the good life and having the blessings and maximizing man's potential. Hey, you can maximize all the potential you want and become a great man. But that greatness outside of Jesus Christ amount to zero in the day you die. So preachers today have thickened messages of the world of motivation and tell people how to maximize their potential. You can maximize all the potential you want and you can live the life with that so-called maximized potential. But outside of Jesus Christ, it, it amounts to zero. And so when you don't preach the law, when you don't preach the word, obviously people will break it. And so Jesus revealed and says, because of lawlessness, because of the lack of the word of God, and because of breaking of the law, okay, the love of many will wax cold. This is one aspect I can see happening today. The old English King James, old King James, translate this lawlessness as iniquity. Because of iniquity, the love of many will grow cold. Today, you go to a contemporary church. You don't hear these three words often or none at all. You don't hear the word sin being preached. You don't hear the word iniquity. And you don't hear the word transgression. All you have, you know, uh, a preaching that is void of this three. Many contemporary Christians have no idea what this three term means. What is iniquity? What is sin? And what is transgression? Yet Jesus warned us because of transgression, because of iniquity, the love of many will wax cold. And so uh, there is no knowledge of what sin is uh, there is no in-depth knowledge of what iniquity is and what transgression is. And therefore, the people continue to live their lives breaking the law. There is lawlessness, not abiding in the law of God, the word of God. That is transgressions. Yes, but more than transgressions, out of it is the iniquity. So let me just give you a very brief uh, explanation. What is sin? What is the difference between sin, iniquity, and transgression. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is like uh, you are supposed to do something, but you're not doing it. It's like, uh, take for example, an archer. An archer shoots at a target. That is the target. That's God's standard. But we miss the target. We sin. So sin is just an act of, it's an act of uh, uh, action. Yes? It's a series of actions, sin. Transgression brings with it a meaning of rebellion. There's a deliberate intent, intentional rebellion against what God has set as the standard. So we transgress against God's law. We can't transgress against any something that is not there, that a standard has not been set. So God sets a standard and man knows that standard he breaks the standard. That's transgression. Then, Pastor, when you say, okay, I understand where is sin. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is, uh, I'm not accomplished. I'm not, uh, I'm not what I should be. I miss the mark. I sin. And transgression is worse. Transgression is, I know what is the standard, but I don't want to follow it. I don't like it. I rebel against it. I, I go against it. That's transgression. That's a more serious form. 
that iniquity is what? Iniquity is the character of the action. The action of sin. The sin is an action. When the archer shoots at the target, that is the sin. He missed the target. But what was the reason he missed the target? So iniquity deals with the inward parts of man, where it's not just an action, it is the character of the action. Is the character sinful? Is the character deceitful? Is the character rebellious? Is the depths of sin? Is the character of the moral or immoral action that comes out from the hearts of man? That's iniquity, the depths of sin. And so therefore, uh, Jesus says, in the last days, the love of many will wax cold because of iniquity. When there is lack of preaching on iniquity and sin of man, you see, sin, iniquity, and transgressions is the root cause of all of man's problem. I repeat that again. Sin, iniquity, and lawlessness is the root cause of all of man's sorrow and problems. That's the reason why Jesus came. Agreed? That's the reason why Jesus came to bring us deliverance and salvation from sin, iniquity, and transgression. If that is the core reason why Jesus came to deliver us from, how is it today the churches and the preachers are saying, don't preach these things? It is old-fashioned. It is a sinful word. Don't preach it. Don't, it, is, it, it is too harsh for the people. Go easy on the people. And so the people have no knowledge of what is truly sin and iniquity and transgression, breaking against God's standard, uh, uh, the character, the, the, the moral character of the action behind our sinful action. And so what do they preach then? They preach materialism, success, maximize potential. It's a polluted and compromised gospel. And in the last days, this will become prevalent. And multitudes will be drawn to this kind of preaching. Multitudes will be drawn to do, do this kind of churches. And it's the Laodicean church. They will give you everything to substitute preaching against iniquity, sin, and lawlessness. They will give you their music. They will give you the laser beam. They will give you the light. They give you a once in a lifetime so-called worship experience, the euphoria of that experience. And they create it with beautiful electronic sounds and, and so forth. And therefore, people become lukewarm in the things of God. And because of lawlessness abound, the love of many will grow cold. So lawlessness is sin. First John chapter three, verse four. First John chapter three, verse four. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. See? So sin is lawlessness and sin is lawlessness, Apostle John says. And so many modern Christians today have no idea the meaning of these three words. So that's the Lodesian church, the lukewarmness that Jesus totally reject. That he will reject, he will spew it out from uh, his mouth. So the cause of this lawlessness are many. The cause, the cause of lukewarmness I've given you are many. There are 12 of them. Some have received a little knowledge and the little knowledge is not enough to convert their soul and warm their hearts to become hot for Jesus. Some have received this truth, but they've taken it lightly. Say, so why, Pastor, they have heard the truth and they take it lightly? They do not respond in the direction of the truth. Their lives are filled with other immediate priorities. Some are lulled into thinking that everything is okay. 
So they are lulled into a false sense of security that they are safe because they have believed. And they have no idea about the meaning of the word belief. They think that it's just something they agree in their mind, giving a mental assent to a set of facts that have been presented to them. And they say, we agree. And by thinking, when they agree with this set of facts of the gospel that's been presented to them, they think that they are saved. But that's not the Bible definition of belief. The Bible definition of John 3.16, whosoever believe is pisto, the Greek word, that has got some uh, characteristics of Matthew 25, the faithful servant who served the Lord with joy and gladness, and he was called the good and faithful servant. Some are deceived into thinking they now have religion, but that religion is a religion of ritual, of form, of tradition, and precept, and so forth. Some have received the truth and heard the truth, and they become lukewarm because they have not fully believed. And I find that this is true in our lives. And, and Jesus makes us many promises in the Bible. And uh, we hear about it. But we are not fully convinced in our heart. Because we are not fully convinced in our heart, we don't live it. We don't experience it. We don't walk into it. You know, I'm reminded many years ago about a communist a communist that was presented with the gospel of Jesus. And after hearing the full presentation of the gospel about heaven and hell, about the judgment of Jesus Christ and, 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 and all that will happen in eternity, he finally made a decision and he says, I cannot believe. I cannot believe your message, the communist says. But he says, if I were like you, who believe this message, who claim that you believe this message, I would crawl the world to tell everyone about this message. But of course, he says, I don't believe your message. The communists tell the Christian. But he says, if I were you who believe in this message, I would crawl the world to tell everyone this message. So may God help us. Sometimes we think we believe the message, but yet we find ourselves lukewarm. The, the, the church finds itself lukewarm. What is the reason? Other than they have immediate priorities. Either uh, it's, they've heard the truth. And why do they take the truth lightly? They may, because they have other priorities. Another reason is because they are not fully convinced. We think we believe, but we may not truly believe all the words of Jesus. We believe to the extent we act it out. We believe to the extent the amount of effort and time we expend on that belief. And so, May God challenge us as we hear this message and lay hold of the three things that Jesus gives us a solution. And he says, you buy from me. You've got to pay the price to get the gold, to get the white raiment and the oil soft. Hallelujah. And then we see his wonderful uh, exhortation to the church of Laodicea. If any man hears my voice, that is the key to... Uh, experiencing him he says if you open the door of your life of your heart or your church i will come into you and i will fellowship with you and you with me okay i want to now bring you to another point all this is uh, you find in chapter 24 and 25 towards the end time now i want to talk to you about the rapture we have looked at the, not, the just a few minutes earlier about this group of people, the lukewarm Christians, the lukewarm church, they will miss heaven. I believe they will miss heaven because Jesus 
demonstrated a complete rejection of lukewarmness in a church and in the life of a Christian. Number two, I want to show you the uh, description of the rapture found in Matthew 24, verse 40 to 44. It's from the same chapter of Matthew 24, reading from verse 40 to 44, and show you something here. Then shall be two in the field. Some people don't believe the rapture. Some people don't believe that there will be a rapture, but the word of God is very clear. Uh, then the two shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Then there shall be two women shall be grinding at the mill. They were just grinding without them realizing. See, uh, possibly Jesus was preaching. Uh, he was at Mount Olive when he, he, he looks towards the village that the people were, two women were grinding at the mill. So he, 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 he always draw from life experiences. And what he sees, he says, there shall be two women that shall be working and grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Then he says there should be two in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. It gives a picture of a sudden disappearance. It gives a picture of someone's being suddenly taken away. Do you know, one, a believer, and two, a non-believer. That's a, a very amazing account. And then he goes on to say, watch ye therefore and pray always. Yes, for you know not what your Lord doth come. You know not what hour your Lord will come, but know this. And if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Some unbelieving uh, uh, people says that, you know, that you can be an unbelieving Christian. Some who don't believe the rapture, they say, this is not a description of the rapture. This is a description where towards the end of the tribulation, there shall be a tragedy, there shall be events and natural disasters. There shall be two in the field and one could be suddenly destroyed and killed. There can be two women grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. So the unbelieving version of the rapture are people who say this one that shall be taken at the mill or in the field relates to sudden destruction that will come and destroy this person. They interpret it that way. They say this is not about the rapture. But I read to you earlier the verse down there. It talks about the Lord's coming. It didn't talk about destruction. It says, watch therefore, for you know not what our Yes, your Lord cometh. So when the Lord comes, that's the taking away. But know this, if, you, if the good man of the house, he knows when the thief would come, he would have watched. Then he make a conclusion that ye be ready for in such an hour you think not the son of man cometh. I want to point you to the word be taken away. Underline that. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Underline the one shall be taken, be taken. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken. The Greek word for the word be taken is para laben. Para laben. Let me give it to you slowly, the spelling. The Greek word is P-A-R-A, is para, P-A-R-A. Then L A La Ben B E I N P A R A L A B E I N. Para La Ben is the word to describe being taken away. Like a bride being taken away to a wedding, to the groom's house. Uh, you see this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, it talks about the vision of the angel coming to Joseph. I hope you are there. Matthew 1, verse 20. 
while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. Remember, Mary did not know any man, and she found she was pregnant with child. And Joseph came to know, to know about it. So the angel came to assure Joseph, Joseph, don't be afraid to take. To take, that word is paralaben. Do not be afraid to take, or paralaben, to take Mary to be your wife, you see. So it's like the Lord taking the woman at the meal or the man in the field. We are taken away into the marriage supper of the Lamb. So this verse helps to confirm uh, you can see the same meaning that we are taken away in the rapture to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The same word paralaben means to be taken away. Of course, paralaben can also be used to mean to take away somebody to be a prisoner, to take away somebody to go somewhere. It simply means to take away. But I've given you the verse in Matthew 1.20. It means that uh, you are to take Joseph, Mary, to be your wife, to take away. And so Christ will take away his people when he comes. There shall be two in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal. One shall be taken and the other left. So uh, with this, I will end here. Uh, there's still one more parable I have not shared with you. That is of the parable of the faithful servant uh, that you can see in also Matthew 24. But I just want to close this morning because of time. And I want you to just close your eyes and just uh, turn to the Lord. And maybe ask God to deliver us from lukewarmness. You may not have considered it that way, but lukewarmness is the enemy of your soul. Lukewarmness in the Christian life, lukewarmness in the church is something our Lord Jesus is totally disgusted and totally will not accept. It was a very dramatic description when he revealed about the condition of the church of Laodicea, and especially Laodicea is the era that we are living now. Bible scholars believe it's the type of condition we are living, and we see it being true. Today, there are many um, who would not preach against sin, iniquity, and transgression. How could they not? That is the root cause of all of man's problems and sorrow today. And that's why Jesus came. Uh, modern Christians have no idea what is transgression, what is iniquity. Some have never heard of it. The pastor would not mention it. They would not preach it. And because of iniquity, the Bible says the love of many believers will begin to wax cold. They will wax cold because they will begin to break the law. They will begin to break the law because they no longer constantly hear the law. They hear man's ideas and philosophy. And the gospel become diluted. Yes, take this message seriously. Lukewarmness is when you hear the truth, but you take the truth lightly. For whatever reason, you have other needs to attend to. You have more urgent, immediate priorities. So though you know the truth, but you take it lightly, you do not take action towards what you hear. That is disgusting to God. That's what Jesus says. i rather you become cold. Because if you are cold, there is a chance the gospel will reach you and you can become hot. But for some reason, after the gospel has come into contact with you, you never turn hot. You turn lukewarm. Something has gone wrong somewhere in your life. You have allowed deception. You have allowed, uh, you walk um, 
you have other priorities, you have uh, 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 not fully convinced. And so what must we do? Jesus says, repent. Let us come back to him. Let us pray the Lord that you will buy from the Lord these three things. Remember, God is after what? God is after your faith. So I want to encourage you, if you are going through trials, you are going through affliction, you are going through difficulty, you are going through in this time of the pandemic, it really tries your faith. Rejoice, because God is after the genuineness of your faith and my faith. But the apostle says, when your faith has been tried through fire, when you fall into various trials and affliction, he says, when your faith has been tried by fire, you will come forth like pure gold. So don't fight the trial of your faith. Don't fight the affliction that you may have to face. In the midst of our adversity, we learn to serve him still. In the midst of our difficulty, we still stretch our giving. Hallelujah. In the midst of shortage, we will still bless the Lord. We will still worship him. And that develops your faith. And that's what Jesus is after. Remember, Jesus is the author and finisher of your life, your faith. He writes the first chapter and he writes the last chapter. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. When your life ends, he writes the concluding chapter. Hallelujah. May he be able to conclude that you have fight the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. Many, when they die and leave this earth, Jesus cannot conclude in the last chapter of their life that she or he have fight the good fight of faith. Why? Because they did not recognize when the affliction comes, when the difficulty comes, God is after. God is after that they can finish that walk. They will go through that valley of fire. They will walk through the waters of storm. But yet they will come out victorious, still believing God, still serving God, still passionate for God, still have the fire for God. Hallelujah. And not begin to be lukewarm and not begin to draw back and tell God, God, I have to attend to all these urgent priorities of my life. I have to attend to all these things first before I have a time to follow your word. But if you do that and you end your life doing that, Jesus will not be able to conclude that you have fought the good fight of faith. If you tell Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I know you have told me the truth, but, but uh, 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 I can't act on the truth. I can't give my life and be committed to live out the truth and do what you call me to do. Because, Jesus, I have many things I have to attend. There are immediate priorities I must attend. And so the genuineness of your faith, he wants to test but the results would be you and I would get a big F. That means failure because the faith has not been tested and he will not be able to conclude the last chapter of your life victoriously and say, my son or my daughter have fought the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. But if you and I, despite all the circumstances, despite all the adversity, despite all the pain and suffering, you will still say, Lord, I will serve you. You are a good God. I believe in your goodness. I believe in you, that you will make a way for me. I will still praise you. Yes. But then even after when you make your stand of faith, God did not make a way. And you will still be willing to say, God, so be it your will, not mine, but your will be done. But Lord, I will still serve you. I will still praise you. I will still give to your kingdom. I will still be passionate about the truth. For this is the reason that why I will live. Jesus will be proud that he has become the author and finisher of your faith. Glory to God. Glory to God. He says, buy from me this gold. Glory to God. Buy from me this white raiment. Have your faith rooted in me that I am your righteousness. 
But know that even though I'm your righteousness, then righteousness is the gift from God. He expects us to have right living, to have right living and honesty and truth in our lives, living right. Hallelujah. It's not just believe alone, but it's living right. It's not just receiving the gift of righteousness, but living right in our life. The God would desire that you will pay the price. You will draw near to him and say, God, I need the anointing upon my life. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I may understand things I've never understood before. And God, I come to you confessing that I am needy. I am blind. I am wretched. I am naked. I need a touch from you. Open thou my eyes, Lord, that I may see. Open my eyes that I may touch Jesus. Open my eyes that I might know what's going on, that I may see. See, the Holy Spirit will not come to you unless you thirst and hunger. The anointing is free. Yes, even though it's free, but it does not come easy. There is a need for seeking. There's a need for praying. There's a need for desiring that you would get on your knees and God and says, what must I do? God, unless you give me the anointing, unless God, you give me this anointing, I can do nothing. I cannot understand your will and your plan. And when I read your word, Lord, I will not be able to understand unless I receive the oil stuff that I may see, that I may understand truly your plans and purposes for my life, God. The reason why you saved me, the reason why you blessed me, the reason why you put resources into my hands, oh God. See, your whole life will change. Your perspective of life will change when the oil stuff comes upon your life, that you begin to see it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Hallelujah. People everywhere, will you lift your hands to God? Will you say, God, deliver me from lukewarmness? I don't want to be the group that Jesus will spew, spew me out from his mouth. That he, there will be a total rejection of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be in the group where I know the truth, but I take the truth lightly and I say, God, hold on, hold on. I have things to do. I have things in my life. I must do first. The needful thing to do is do what God has shown you. To walk in the light that he has given you today. Lukewarmness is when you know the truth, but the truth is not able to warm you enough to convert your soul and cause you to surrender totally to him. But you will say, Lord, yes, thank you for the knowledge. Thank you that I received the truth. But nothing changes in your life. Nothing changes in your timetable. Nothing changes in how you arrange your life when you leave. That's lukewarmness. It's even worse than you are being cold. Than cold because when you are cold, there's a chance the gospel will come fresh and warm you up. But when the gospel has come to you, when the word of God has come to you, something has gone wrong. You've allowed something to come between the fire of the gospel to warm your soul. You know, there's a parable in the Bible that says these people were invited to the wedding. The Bible says he has prepared a wedding, a great wedding for his son. And he says, go to the highways and byways, bring and invite as many. And these people came, but they were not interested to come to the wedding. They says, I have married a wife. I have bought me a land. I bought me a cow. I have things I must attend to this life. You know what the master says? When these people say, I cannot come. You know what the master says? The master says, these are not worthy. They are not worthy of the invitation because when they're given the invitation to come to the great wedding, everything has been prepared. 
They said, I have bought me a cow. I have married a wife. I have a business to attend. I have a land that I must cultivate. The Lord was angry. He says, they are not worthy of my invitation. And then he says, go to the highway, go to the byway, go invite as many as you can. And many that were originally invited to come to the wedding never made it to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But many others later were added and came into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us not miss the greatest event, listen to me, the greatest event that is about to take place is the marriage supper of the Lamb. There can be no other greater event that be invited and to make it into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, may God help us. May the Spirit of God prepare us. May the Spirit of God so stir us and say, God, don't let me miss it. Would you deliver me this morning? Lord, would you help me this morning to adjust the priorities in my life? Wherever you are, people lift your hands to him. I want you to pray. You have listened long enough and I want you to talk to God. Honda Raba Shikiri Hate. Manta Karaba Sute Karama Shateria. O Raman Suntu Karaba Shiridi Karaba Satere. O Karama Shitaraba Satara. Yetarama Shikarama Sitiri Hatara. Life must not be the same anymore after you come into contact with Jesus. I want to invite you to just on your video and I want to pray for you. All right, let us pray as a church. Let us pray for God's mercy, God's forgiveness and God's deliverance to deliver all of us from any lukewarmness in our lives. The God, we say, Lord, we are sorry. We are sorry, Lord, that we have not prayed enough. Faithfulness Faithfulness is not just having, doing repeated action. When we serve God, whatever area of our lives, we must serve with faith. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Pisto, faithful. He served with faith and served with joy. It must not just be a repeated action. You do it out of obligation. You do it out of drudgery. It's very simple to serve God. Oh, that's not faith. May God change your heart. Whatever area, how small, you do it with great joy, great faith, knowing the Lord is the one that have called you. It's the Lord that have commissioned you. Oh, wonderful Jesus, help us to be good and faithful servant. God would rather you not do it if you don't do it with joy and you don't do it with faith. Because the scripture reveal that servant, that multiply the five parable and the two parable were servants who did it with faith, believing the words of Jesus, that the master will return and he will give an account and he will be rewarded. He's doing unto him. It's with joy and faith. Hallelujah. In other words, be a believing servant. Be a believing worker. Hallelujah. Will you lift your hands and say, God, help me to be ready. You gave us, Lord, this awesome warning. Two shall be in the field. One will be taken. It's unthinkable if you and I are the one left behind. Two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left behind. It's unthinkable if we think we are secure, we think we are safe with the little knowledge that we have. But you know, that little knowledge can be dangerous. It can lull you into a sense of security. That's why the scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You don't work for your salvation. Your salvation has been free, has been freely given by God. But yet you need to work it out. We need to work it out. 
We need to work it out. It's not just by mental belief alone that you are saved. Work out that salvation. As the man with the five parables, he worked out a way to multiply the gift of grace. And he traded his talents and he made five more talents. There is a need of working out. And Jesus warned us parable after parable to watch and be ready for you know not when the hour of the master's coming. I wish Jesus just left us with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Oh, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. If I just believe in him, I shall not perish. And I have everlasting life. I get to go to heaven and my life remain the same. I continue to live my life the same. I don't need to make adjustment. But the fact of the matter is, not only he left us, John 3, 16, he left us parables after parables, parables after parables, passages of scripture after passages of scripture, where he warned us that the unprofitable servant will be cast into the lake where there's been weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's beyond a shadow of doubt. He warned us that I will spill you out from my mouth because you are neither cold nor hot, but you are lukewarm. You have to face these parables. You have to face these teachings of Jesus. You have to face it because it's from the same Bible, you see. So what is God saying to us? That's more than what he said in a summary form in John chapter 3, verse 16. If you put all the passages of scripture together, you put all the writings of Apostle Paul together, then you can understand there is a need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Hallelujah. Will you lift your hands right now wherever you are? Oh, will you talk to God? Mantakaya suku raba shididi. Oko rama shanda raba shika rama sate. Ye raba shika raba sika raba shakaraba. If anyone here this morning, if you are serving God out of a burden, if you are serving God oh, with complaint, if you are serving God because you feel that you must, will you ask God to forgive you? We ask God, will you come to God in repentance? Will you say, God, forgive me. I have missed the point. I have missed the point. And if there's someone here, there are several, there are many. Here this morning, you think you are saved, but you have no interest to work in the master's vineyard. You, you have no interest. You think that's not for you. You think that it's just for the pastor. Is you think that it's just for the full-time workers. You have no interest to work, to be a part, to put your hand to contribute, to advance the cause of Christ, whom you claim to be your Lord and Savior, and you think you are on your way to heaven. You have no interest, no desire. There is delay and procrastination. You have said, Lord, I bought me a cow. I bought me a wife. I married a wife. I bought me a cow. I bought me a land that I must do before I can work in your kingdom. May God speak to you. May you repent this morning. Jesus warned so clearly in the parable. Do a test this morning and ask God, God, help me. I don't want to hear the truth and take the truth lightly. Lord, the truth is not able to convert my soul. So I now this morning, I bring my soul in subjection to the truth of your word. And Lord, let your word convert me. For the Bible says, be thou converted. Let thy sins be blotted out. How does that conversion take place? The word of God coming to you. Will you submit yourselves? I want to ask you a question. I've given you enough of the word. The last three messages, last two messages plus this Sunday. Would you ask God, what will you do? with these parables 
that Jesus taught. If you can find the answer to these parables that Jesus taught, you will find the answer to what you must do with your life. What will you do with these parables? What will be your response? Are they just Bible stories that he put inside? Are these just stories for him to fill the pages? Or are you just believing on John 3.16? You have believed all your life that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Or have you seek a deeper understanding what that belief means, what that belief entails? What's the Bible definition of belief? Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Plus, 10 of these parables that Jesus taught. Put them together. If you can find the answer to these passages of parables that he taught one after another, listen to me, you can find the answer to what you must do for the rest of your life when you are on earth. Glory to God. I know this is a hard message. I will just preach the truth because one day my hands will be free. I will not be guilty for not teaching the whole counsel of God's word. The blood will not be on my hands. So when you lift your hands and pray, you pray for yourself and you pray for me. God, God help me from today to prepare. And you know, this preparation is a lifetime. To prepare to meet Jesus is for life. Hallelujah. Lord, and many areas in my life are not adjusted. Help me, God. Father, I thank you this morning for this church, for all of us that you have saved and called into your kingdom. And I know, Lord, whoever you love, you chasten and you rebuke. And this morning, Lord, you bring an enlargement of understanding to all of us. This message, Lord, is not meant to condemn us. But this message, Lord, is meant to prepare our lives, to prepare our hearts, to help us to see whether we really believe in you, to wake us up from our slumber and reveal the true condition of our spiritual state. And so, Lord, while we still have time, we want to repent and we want to change. When we know, Lord, it will not be overnight. It will be perhaps weeks or months before we get there, before we allow you. So this is our prayer, Spirit of God, that you help each one of us. You loved us. Therefore, Lord, you warn us. What must we do that we might do the works of God? And what does it mean to believe in you and Jesus Christ whom you send? Lord, is it that simple that we just believe in our mind and in our head that we believe in you, Father, and then the Lord Jesus Christ whom you send? Or Lord, does it entail more? The people in the Gospels ask you, Lord, what must we do? to do the works of God. You told the people the answer that you may know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And this morning we ask the same question, what must we do to do the works of God? Lord, is it just to believe in our mind and in our head that you are the one, the Father and Jesus Christ whom you have sent? And we can do this, Lord, in just five minutes. And Lord, is that all? Is that all that is required of us, your children, 
after all the great price you paid, the great effort, the great sacrifice, Lord, that you pay for us. Is that all, Lord, we will do in five minutes and say, we believe in you and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Or is it, Lord, that we take together all your teaching, all the parables you taught about the kingdom and find the answer to these parables. And when we find the answer to the parables, we will have a fuller picture of what you require from us. Oh, wonderful master, please, I ask for the release of your eyes soft, your ointment to anoint our eyes that we will truly see and understand and not be deceived. Lord, I pray that we will not be deceived to be lulled into a false sense of security, but that we will always be seeking in fear and trembling looking, Lord, looking to you, ever wanting to know, Lord, have we missed you somewhere? Have we missed trusting you somewhere? Have we missed following you somewhere? Oh God, give us this spirit, I pray. Give us this searching, hungering spirit, always to say, Lord, surely there must be something more you ask of me in my life that will please you. So Father, I pray for everyone that lift their hands right now, that you come and minister. And the Lord is saying to us, yes, in the midst of this adversity, in the midst of your struggle, you have desired to hear a message of hope and encouragement. But the Spirit of God is working differently. His timetable and his values is not that which we think as a human being. And God, even in this time of adversity and pandemic, he is changing our mindset. He's turning us to turn to him. And he wants to put eternity in your heart. Many, many of my children at this hour is looking to me to help them overcome their earthly fears and their earthly struggles, and their earthly pain. But I, I, the Spirit of the Lord, has wants to put in you, my children, that which is, that which is, that really counts, the real crux of your life, how your life will end, is that you will understand my heart and my purpose. And so my people, Allow your spirit to be warm. Allow your spirit to receive my word. Receive this fresh word from heaven. That understand this is my priority for my church. This is my priority for my people whom I've given my life. I have proven my love for you. I have qualified my people to speak this word to you. Because... I am, I have given my life and my blood for you. Therefore, I am qualified to speak to you this word that has been in my heart all this while for my church. It's my desire that you hear what is in my heart that I have for you, my people, that you will not be destroyed, that you will not be lost, but that you will be secure in your eternity. For I want to put eternity in your heart. I have paid the price for you, and therefore I am the one who is worthy not only to take the seals from the Father's hand, but I'm worthy to give you this word of warning and this word of understanding that I will not accept. I will not accept these things that I have first already revealed to you in my word. So be awakened, my people. Be awakened this morning. 
to the word that I have revealed all this while in the scriptures. Jesus, I give you praise. Jesus, I give you praise. Lord, we receive your chastening and we receive your rebuke. God, we only pray for your mercy, for your long suffering, for your grace. The Lord, you help us in our preparation from this day until we see you face to face. Wonderful Jesus, restore back, Lord, the first love for those who have lost their first love. I want to pray for those if you feel you have lost the first love. You have, you have felt you have lost the fire when you first came to know the Lord. The Christianity that you first know. It has been a long time you have never cried in the presence of God. You feel so hard to pray. You have no love for his word. And for you have no interest to advance his kingdom. How can you call him Lord and Master where you have no interest and desire to advance the cause of Christ and advance the cross? May the Spirit of God touch you today. And that's you. I want you to just lift your hands. I want to pray for you. You don't need to be ashamed because we can be honest with God. When we are honest with God, he will restore us. So, Father, I pray for these who lift their hands. Quickly lift your hands and say, God, I want a renewed relationship. I want to make a fresh surrender to Jesus. From the rest of my life, I want to advance the cause of Christ. If that is you, this will be one decision you will never regret when you go to heaven. When you say, Lord, I want to advance the cause of Christ, whatever I can do with the limited time and with the amount, with the limited finance, my talent, whatever, Lord, I want to advance the cause of Christ. If that's your desire, I want to work in the master's vineyard. That's your desire. Wherever you are, please lift your hands as you follow me. Mante kaya shikiri haka raba satara. Uka raba shiriri karaba satara. I know we are running late, but I'm just flowing the Holy Spirit. I just want to pray for all of you. Father God, Father God, let none of us miss your plan and purpose. Makaraba sutiri hata. Hallelujah. 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 Remember, Lukewarmness, the Spirit of God is saying that lukewarmness is not just lack of action. Lukewarmness is a heart issue. It's the heart. It's the heart. The heart needs to be touched by God. The heart needs to return to God. The heart needs to receive a new understanding. The eyes need to be touched with oil self that we may see. So today, may we serve God with faith, believing, be believing servants and not grudging servants, not reluctant servants. Hallelujah. That's the word of the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. Be believing servants, be joyful servants. Glory to God. Will you desire? There are some who have no desire to work in the Lord's vineyard. You don't know what to do. Where is your vineyard? The vineyard is the church where you attend. God gives each one of us a vineyard to work in the master's vineyard. If you take this church to be your church, this is the place where you serve. This is the place where you ask God, God, let me do something. Let me contribute. Don't, it's not, we thank God for your tithes and your offering. But you know, God is, God wants more. God wants you to be personally involved. God wants you to put your hands on the plow. Find something to do through the church. And you see, God will bless your life. For this is the plan of God. Hallelujah. Father, we commit each one to you. Please, Lord, don't stop working in us. 
Please, Lord, break this word of life to us. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy to speak your word because you shed your blood for us. So we receive your word this morning. We receive it in our hearts. In Jesus' wonderful name. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. So God bless you, people. Listen to this message again, these three messages, and may God bless you richly.